want you to watch this video this morning. I want you to listen especially to the last sentences that this fella has to say. changing their futures through Financial Peace University. I started it with a bad suit and an overhead projector. I set the room for 135 people, four people came. And now today we've had over one and a half million families go through this course. That's over two million people across this nation. You may be wondering, what is it? What Financial Peace University is about is a return to God's ways of handling money, but in a very practical, step-by-step, game plan showing you exactly how to do it. FPU is about learning how to control your money. When you make these dollars behave, you're going to get this sense of power over your money that you've never, ever had. Don't move into a home with 62 debts or six debts or, or two debts and no money. You move into a home broke with a bunch of debt around your neck, Murphy will move in your spare bedroom, bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. Marriages are being made stronger. Couples are learning how to talk to each other about money and getting on the same page. The closest statistical correlation to success going through this program are those that actively engage in this budgeting process. And for those that are married, they're doing it together. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you get disgusted and you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I am not going to live like this anymore. We're done. We're changing this thing. Talk about the why. Talk about your dreams. Ask your spouse, what would we do? Where would we travel to? What would we buy? What would be changed if we became something as a couple where we were working together on that? Now, man, I'm sure you know this, and we've been talking about it for the last few minutes, but it's very true. Women are different, aren't they? Say yes. yes. One of the things you may or may not know is they have a gland right in here that you don't have. It's called the security gland. And when she is feeling insecure due to money issues, that gland spasms, and it is attached to her face. This nine lesson, 90 minute class will challenge you. Now this is a boot camp, I'm your coach. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable sometimes. You're gonna go home and go, I don't really like him tonight. Now if I agree with that, which would make you wrong. <laughs> That's what happens when the coach coaches you, doesn't it? He kind of rubs you the wrong way. There's a little friction on there, right? I've had some good coaches and they lit me up a time or two, but it caused me to go places I couldn't go otherwise. Life change is never easy, but you won't be alone. You'll watch a DVD each week and discuss it with your small group. Your classmates will encourage you and help you take those first steps. You'll walk away from FPU knowing how to relate with money. You'll learn how to pay off debt and save for the future. And you'll learn how to protect your plan. We aren't born knowing everything we need to about money. We learn, and there's no better place to learn than the Word. The Bible offers more than 800 scriptures on money, and Financial Peace University is based on that solid foundation. You are literally going to be doing things every week differently than you ever have based on biblical principles. And things like doing a budget, things like working with your spouse, things like singles having an accountability partner, things like teaching your kids so that a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. It's not theory. This is actual application on everything. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? What would happen? If the, what would happen to the kingdom of God if the people of God were out of debt? All you need is a plan. Financial Peace University is that plan. I want to, I'm not pushing for Dave Ramsey. I want you to hear what he said. What would happen if the people of God handle God's money or handle their money God's way? I've asked somebody to give a personal testimony this morning because they've been at a place to where some of you might be. And then I want to, I wanted to talk this morning about the challenge, the choice, and the commitment of living this way. Bruce, would you come? This one right here. First of all, uh, first of all, uh, my name is Bruce Lau. Um, I am the stewardship chairman uh, here at Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church. And uh, one thing I would like to say is, I want if you know my wife Kathy, uh, I'd like to picture, I'd like for you to picture her 
right here beside me because the testimony that I'm going to give is our testimony. I wanted Kathy to do the talking, but she couldn't do it. So she just, she was too nervous. So just, just picture her beside me, please. She's a very godly woman, and we've been in this together for 24 years now. Um, so I, I love her to death. And, and there was a time then that, that we really couldn't talk about money, um, but we can now. Uh, just like the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is a servant to the lender. And there was a time when I really was a servant to the lender. And it's not fun being a servant to someone, unless it's God. Um, I had eight years into my marriage, um, I probably had about $30,000 in credit card debt. And we were barely making that much at that time. Um... We were one or two paychecks away from uh, being on the street. Now, thanks to my family, they wouldn't have let me end up. They wouldn't have let me end up in the street. Neither one of our families would have. But that's how close we were to being a financial train wreck. Uh, I had two car payments. we had to live in an apartment. We were living in an apartment at the time like a lot of young couples do. So, you know, we, it, what made things worse for us at that time is we, we, we were lukewarm Christians at best. I, I could almost say that we weren't really even Christians or believers. Um, we went to church if the mood struck us and often um, sleeping in was a higher priority than going to church. Fast forward to 2007 when uh, we began, we took our first Crown Financial Ministries class, which is a lot like Financial Peace University. Uh, And God changed us from the inside out with his word and and his spirit. and, And we started to give over everything we had to him. Um... But at that time, once again, I, I, I found our family strapped in debt. Two car payments, a very large um, home equity line of credit on top of the mortgage that we already had. Um, and w- we really had our priorities completely out of whack. Uh, one of the quotes I really like from Billy Graham, it says that, give me one minute with a person's checkbook and I'll tell you where their heart is. And... I think our hearts were in the wrong place. And I shouldn't speak for Kathy, but I know mine was. Um, thanks to the Lord, His Word, Crown Finance, we're in a, a very different situation today. Um, we're now debt-free, except for our, our monthly house payment, which should be gone in 12 years. Had I learned this sort of stuff at a much younger age, um, my house payment wouldn't be coming to an end when I'm, I turned 60. My, my home payment would have come to an end 10 years ago. I, I've met a lot of 40, uh, 40-year-old people who don't have a one penny of debt. And it's because they got started, uh, they got off to a better start than we did. Um, I have more commitment than I've ever had. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, more contentment. Do you feel content? Do you have financial peace? Being content is a good place to be. Uh, Everyone, um, in my opinion, deserves to feel content. And everyone in here deserves that. In other words, be happy with what you have or maybe even less than what you have. I'd like to just bring up one scripture that's very powerful that challenges uh, me on a daily basis, and it's this one, Matthew six twenty four. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, and hates a very big. That's a very strong word. He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted 
to the one and despise the other. Devoted to God, despise money. You cannot serve both God and money. We have a long, long way to go. I have not figured it out yet, but thanks to this class, Kathy and I are, are, are well on our way, so thank you. Would you stand with me with the reading of God's Word? Bruce, thank you for that word this morning because um, in 27 years, I have found people that have become a slave in some part of their life. It is rare to find folks that, that have found that placing God first and keeping God first in their life relieves them of the pressure and of the stress of trying to live to be something that they aren't. Living to be the people of God is, is it's, it's a choice. Hear what the people of God said uh, in, from Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, uh, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah, and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, to possess but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst, and afterwards I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them, and your eyes saw what I did to Egypt." And afterwards you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. Then they fought with you and I handed them over to you and you took possession of their land and I destroyed them before you. Then came King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, sent out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over to the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by the sword, by your sword, or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and oliveyards that you did not plant. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along, all along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I read this passage to you because I want you to know that Joshua simply was telling a story to the people. We have a story that we have lived by. If I ask you to sit down and I would say to you, tell me about your family, 
you would, your story would match up with what Joshua was listening to or was trying to tell the people, here's what happened to you, and here's what happened to you, and here's what happened to you. And then in the midst of that, the point of all that was is that he is laying out to them, you were slaves down in Egypt, and you asked God to bring you out, and God did. But time and time again, you've turned to go back because it's very difficult to leave your old ways. And so Joshua lays out a challenge to these people, choose this day whom you will serve. One of the reasons that I would say to you that most of us, it is very easy to give our heart and soul over to God. Most of us do that because in in a sense we're doing it to bring peace and contentment, but that very act does something else to us, is that it is very difficult to bridge the distance between our heart and our mind that we're being transformed in such a way that God takes away the things that would enslave us and would take away, instead of, instead of fulfilling all the wants that we have, is that we see that we need God in such a way and serving God brings a peace and contentment to us that we actively pursue. Now, we live in a world that if you're going to do that, if you're going to serve God and put away these other things, I need to offer you a warning. That is the challenge I'm offering you this morning. Is it, do we really want to and intend to serve God? If we do that, I can, I'm, there's a warning that comes with this, is that if, if you're trying to do that, you're going to be walking counter to the culture in which you live. There are many, many people in this world that are paid sums of money in order to tell you how you can live better. They're, they're paid to tell you what will bring you happiness And they're paid to tell you these things, and they do a very good job about that because the messages we get are always about you need this, you need this, you need this, so that nothing after a while brings any joy, brings any contentment, and most of all, brings any peace. I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat in my office counseling with young couples, older couples, and one of, the, one of the things that divides them, one of the things that most of all is they've never gotten on the same page. And you may be saying, preacher, I'm tired of hearing about money. This is not about money, folks. This is about you and about your financial health and about your spiritual health and about your health in general. Because if you're a slave in any part of your life to, rather than serving God and having God first then that keeps you from being the person that God intended for you to be, first of all. And second of all, it keeps you in a place to where that you're always struggling. You're always struggling to figure out what makes me happy. Joshua issued a challenge to those people. And and really and truly what he was saying to them in, in this passage he recounted the story of them coming back from Egypt and he said to them, if going back to Egypt is going to make you happy, if serving the gods that your father served down in Egypt makes you happy, then by all means, do that. But you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. And I would say that to you today. If serving God is going to make you happy, you've got to make a choice. Uh, This week, uh, we had almost 80 people come to, and signed up for the Run for God. Now you can tell, the physical specimen that I am, running away from the table would suit me better than running three miles. Just push back from the table. So I, I signed up for the Run for God because my wife said, you need to sign up, and I signed up. I wasn't carrying the same commitment into that, unfortunately, that I should have been, even though that I probably know that I need it. 
And so Monday I walked by and I looked at the book and I thought, gosh, I ought to read that, but I'm busy today. And Tuesday I walked by and said, I really ought to look in that book to see what I'm supposed to be doing. But you know what? It'll be there tomorrow. And Wednesday I walked by and I looked at it and this little voice that speaks to me said, you know what? You're not doing a thing in the world but cheating yourself by not opening the book and seeing what you're supposed to do. You made a commitment out there to those folks that you signed, you signed up for this course and you had no intention of following through. But if you're going to do it, for goodness sakes, open the book. So I opened it up and I began to read it and I'm trying to do the things that I've committed myself to do. You see, I had a choice. I could have left it lying there or I could have gotten on board with it. Folks, let me show you some places in the scripture. Any choice you make, any choice you make about your faith, you need to know this. You need to know that, that you need to count the cost of what it's going to... Don't rush into anything blindly. Measure it out. The Bible says that no man builds the barn without knowing what it's going to cost him. No man builds a barn. There's, there's going to be a... If you're going to order your life that you're going to have this peace, this contentment, there's going to be a cost to that because it's going to ask you to do things that you may not want, that you may not want to do, and so you choose not to do them. But if you do make the choice that you're going to serve God, then be honest. Be honest in what you're committing to. The Bible tells a story over in the fifth chapter of Acts about a man and woman named Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they sold a piece of property, and so what happened was is they promised that they would lay that money before God, and so when they came to offer it to God, they decided to hold back and not bring what they had promised. And in doing that, when they were asked, is this what you brought? Yes, this is all there was. They lied about their intent. They lied about their purpose. And the Bible says that the young men carried the body of Ananias out. Sapphira comes in later. They had conspired together to lie about what they had promised God. And they also carried her out. It's not that they didn't give all that they had promised. It's that they had promised and did not follow through. Folks, it's our choice whether we serve God the way that God is calling us to serve Him. And that's your choice that's my choice we need to count the cost and we need to know this about all of this when we're confronted with our own lives the rich young ruler when he came to jesus and he asked the question he was seeking him and he said to jesus what must i do he asked the question and jesus said to him sell all you have and give to the poor he didn't say give all you have to the poor he just said, give it to the poor. You know why he said that? He wanted him to sell it all because he knew if that young man held on to anything that was already separating him from God, it would just continue to separate him. And he realized that you've got to, you've got to turn it all over to God in order for God to, to use it and to teach you how it's to be used. Now, I have to tell you that I agree with Bruce as far as borrowing. Borrowing can enslave folks. I don't know many of you that can make a house, just buy a house straight up. If you can, I applaud you. I do applaud you. Sometimes it's necessary that we need to borrow. But we need to, we need to keep in our mind that when we're borrowing and when we're mortgaging and leveraging our future, when we're leveraging our present, we need to keep in mind that comes with a cost. It comes not just with an emotional, but it comes with a spiritual quality to it that if, if we're allowing our, our wants to overwhelm us and come before us, to get, get between us and God, we need to reevaluate that. We have a choice to do that. We don't have to live like everybody else in the world lives we don't have to live like culture says that we have to live we need to live according to the way that scripture says 
that we should live. If we used our money, what Dave Ramsey said, if we used our money God's ways, the question is, would it make a difference in our life? I'm asking that question. I'm, I'm not going to answer that question for you. If we used our resources God's way, would it make a difference in our lives, in my life, in your life? You'll have to answer that question yourself. Joshua asked for a commitment from the people of God. He said to them, choose this day. You choose. I'm not going to choose for you. You've got to choose because you're going to have to live this out. The Bible says that if wealth and fame and those sort of things are, are what we need, then it says the lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. This also is vanity. Now this is from the guy that wrote vanity, vanity, all is vanity. A very negative outlook on life. But he's got a point here. Once upon a time in my life, I was, uh, I can honestly say that there was more contentment in my life when I had less. The more that I seem to gain, the more that I seem to have, the more that I want to protect it, the more that, I, the more that I'm afraid of losing it. I don't know if you are that way, but sometimes that's, what happens in my own life? I, I, how much is enough? How much is really enough? And so we gain and we gain. Sometimes at the point of not doing things God's way. I would say to you this morning, the things that you own, do you own them? I mean, do you really own them? Or do they own you? If today, if today your life dramatically changed, would you lament the fact that there was, had been a great change or would you cry about the things that were leaving your life and you were losing that in the end really make no difference? Young people, this may not make a bit of sense to you this morning, what I'm saying. In fact, you may look, be looking at me and saying, you just don't know how it is. And I would actually understand that if you said that to me because I once upon a time was in a place where you are. I focused on all the things that I thought would bring me the joy and the happiness. That, But those material things, as time goes on, they've become less and less important. That I want to develop, if, it, I want to develop my relationships more than anything else because the value of friends, the value of things that the rust will not decay or the moth will not destroy, again, from the Scripture, those things that cannot be destroyed are becoming more and more important to me. I don't know where each of you are in your walk with Christ. I can, only, I can only answer for myself. But Bruce had a point there a minute ago, no man can serve two masters. I would ask you today that as we think about our own lives, as we think about how we're serving God, have we given God access to all parts of our life? I'm not talking about control this morning. I'm actually talking about access at this point. What is it that brings you the most happiness, the most contentment, the most peace? God is trying to do a work in our life. And I would finish this sermon by simply saying this, what would happen? What would happen if God's people used their money the ways that God intended I will leave you with this from John Wesley. John Wesley, a lot of sayings are attributed to him, but I like this one. John Wesley was, uh, John Wesley was a pretty smart guy. He had a statement that said, make all the money you can. It's funny. People say that he was thinking starving to death. That's not what he said. He said, make all the money you can. But it's, save 
all the money you can. Don't spend it on frivolous things. And then the part that makes all that work, he said, then give. Give all you can. I think that's God's way. Make, save, and give. For folks, it's when that we have found our relationship with Jesus Christ to be the most important thing in our life. And our response to that is how that we think about the things that will try to entrap us and the things that will try to enslave us. For some of you, that may be the struggle you're having today. What do I do? I would simply say to you this morning this. Choose this day whom you will serve. It's your choice. It's not my choice for you. It's your choice. Choose whom you will serve. And then do the very best you can to serve the one that you've chosen. Because let me tell you something. If you've chosen God in the public sphere and then you go into your private life and try to live that out, there's such a contradiction, there's such a conflict in that that there is no joy in that at all. If you choose to serve God, then give and serve God fully, completely. And put your trust in His grace and in His leading of your life. Will you pray with me?